Thank you to Mubi for sponsoring this video. At the centre of Paul Thomas Anderson's films, there is often a power struggle between his characters. Whether it's the elder porn director and his young star, the ruthless capitalist and the opportunist preacher, the leader of a monolithic cult and his troubled subject, or the laid-back PI and the uptight lawman. More often than not, these battles are between two men, because typically, men are more hungry for power or liable to clash egos. I think you're so fucking above it. So high and mighty. And what am I to you? Some loser? With the release of his latest film, Phantom Fred, some critics have accused Anderson of celebrating this seemingly toxic masculinity. Shut up! Shut the fuck your mouth! Right. Entirely too much movement at breakfast. I disagree that it's a celebration, but it's certainly a core theme that runs throughout his filmography. I mean, come on, he originally rose to fame by creating a story about a well-endowed porn star. This is a giant cock. It's because of this abnormally large body part that Dirk Diggler has a path to success and fame. And even though cocaine deflates his notorious prowess, his ego remains enlarged. I want to fuck! It's my big dick! So everybody get ready fucking now! Freddy Quell from The Master is arguably an even more extreme male characterization. He's the primordial man, prone to alcoholism, obsessed with sex, and easily aggravated. But like Dirk, whose emasculated father leads him to seek out a more dominant patriarchal figure in Jack Horner, Freddy quickly falls under the spell of Lancaster Dodd. Yet although Dodd is... A writer, a doctor, a nuclear physicist, a theoretical philosopher. But above all, I am a man. It's the last one that ends up ringing the most true. He's a man who needs to be at sea to stay disciplined, as he's so easily drawn into a conflict. Every time he sits to write, a new attack is launched against him, and he spends too much time defending himself. If, if you already know the answers to your questions, then why ask, pig fuck? Despite this, Lancaster's ego makes him want to appear infallible and godlike, with every word he writes taken as scripture. He's like a number of Anderson's protagonists who want to reign over their environments. Whether it's Frank T.J. Mackey, the cunt. who wants to control and manipulate women, and tame the cunt. Daniel Plainview, who wants to drain and commandeer Mother Earth's resources, or Reynolds Woodcock, with his sacred environment and immovable routine. There's nothing I can say to get your attention aimed back at me. What do you want? I cannot begin my day with a confrontation. In short, these men are uncompromising. It's their way or the highway. I will not apologize for who I am. There will be blood, the master, and inherent vice travel through key eras of 20th century America. These films are primarily character-based, yet they have larger implications, focusing on the country's male-dominated power structures, capitalism, religion, and government. Although these are far-reaching entities, they are still beholden to the primal psychology of the men who hold the highest positions of power. Men who look for weaknesses in people, like blood to sharks. Whether it's Plainview, using his adopted son to play on the sympathies of a Christian community, or the way the vices of hippie culture are exploited for both financial and government tyranny. Anderson's men are often damaged, whether it stems from family tragedy, the horrors of war, or extreme isolation and gruelling work. Frank T.J. Mackey, perversely, takes his aggression out on women, even though his father was the one who abandoned him when his mother was dying. Do you really think that she's going to be there when things go bad, huh, guys? It's as though he's trying to reach out to him by committing the same sins. And I cheated on her over and over and over again because I wanted to be a man. I am the one who says yes, yeah. no, no. Now. now. My fucking mind then. <sighs> so stupid, that fucking mind, stupid. No, I'm an idiot. Why aren't you with that lovely girl? I got no reason, I'm a fool. <laughs> oh, fucking idiot, fucking idiot, fucking idiot, fucking idiot. These protagonists often create barriers to stop them falling prey to what they will consider weak, like emotional jealousy. Although Daniel's son, H.W., helps him make his fortune, 
it also creates a vulnerability within him, which adversaries clearly acknowledge and try to play against him. And not turn it over to us. We'll make you rich. You spend time with your boy. His reaction is extreme because it hits a nerve. One night I'm going to come to you inside of your house, wherever you're sleeping, and I'm going to cut your throat. Similar to Jack Horner, who overreacts when a frat boy insults his work. Well, your fucking films suck now anyway. Because deep down he feels the same. These men repress their feelings, only to eventually erupt. It can be therapeutic and lead to a positive change, but it can also be tragic. Like little Bill from Boogie Nights, whose name says it all really. The fuck are you doing? What the fuck does it look like I'm doing? He's frequently emasculated by his wife, often in public. Shut up, Bill. You're embarrassing me. Yeah, little Bill, shut up. This builds up in him like a volcano, which causes him to explode in the most horrifically violent way. Plainview reacts in a similar fashion after he finds out his so-called brother was deceiving him. The moment he starts to suspect that he's an imposter, we see Daniel shirtless, which makes him appear more open and vulnerable. He's gotten closer to this stranger than he has to anyone, which makes the fact that he got suckered all the more unbearable. Despite this, he gets a chance to redeem himself, and Daniel lets it all out. I've abandoned my child! I've abandoned my child! I've abandoned my boy! It seems to create a positive outcome, because in the next scene, he's gotten everything he desires. In the foreground, the pipeline is being laid out, which was his central focus. And what was nagging in the background at all times is finally resolved too. He reunites with HW, but it's still not enough for him. He still wants to settle every time he felt slighted. Yes, I made a deal with Union. My son is happy, he's safe. Congratulations. I'm taking care of him now, so. Excellent. You look like a fool, don't you, Tilford? In Punch Drunk Love, Barry Egan seems to be on the other side of the spectrum. He's grown up in a predominantly female environment. Are you gay now? I, I don't know. <laughs> Likely because of this, he shies away from typically masculine traits. Are you stroking you, baby? No, I'm not. Or even when he's managing people at work, he tries to avoid pushing his authority. That shouldn't be there, Rico. I don't want to be a dick, but that could hurt somebody. It already did hurt somebody. It hurt me. Let's please move that. Barry doesn't know how to express his masculinity and is eaten alive by irrational fear and anxiety. His journey in the film is to embrace that side of it. Oh, fuck yourself! By confronting a hyper-masculine nemesis. Fuck! Above all else, these characters need balance. Lancaster Dodd pushed himself to another extreme. He believes he's a superior being, refusing to accept the animal that's within us all. Oh, God! And it's the women in many of these characters' lives who are often the real masters. They are seemingly the only ones who can be authoritative around these alpha males. And they can help support and guide them to a higher path. Stop with this idea. <sighs> Put it back in its pants. <sighs> It's Reynolds who struggles the most with these dynamics. The House of Woodcock, a name that is comically masculine, is not only managed by Reynolds' sister, who stands up to him whenever it's called for. I'll go right through you and it'll be you who ends up on the floor, understood? But it's also financed by another woman. So perhaps he reacts to this in his romantic relationships, which are very one-sided. Alma starts out as his prop and has to conform to his world and accept his abnormal behavior. All your rules and your walls and your doors and your people. Yet because of this, there's no compromise. And he's forever cursed, unless the cycle is broken. Alma does this by poisoning him and resetting the power dynamics. Though Reynolds still struggles to accept this change and his ego flares back up. No one gives a tinker's fucking curse about Mrs. Ford's satisfaction. It seems unlikely that it could ever be completely tamed. But he's willing, at least, to relinquish some of that control. In an abstract sense, the poisonous mushrooms seem to combat his own toxic behaviour. Similar to the way many artists like Paul Thomas Anderson use their art forms to help remove the poisons within themselves. And as an audience, we can use that 
to help guide us through the darkness of our own lives. Many fans of Paul Thomas Anderson may not have seen the documentary he made, Shenun, with his composer Johnny Greenwood, which premiered on Movies Platform. That's how I originally saw it. And what I love most about their service is the diverse range of content. From cult classics to award-winning masterpieces, forgotten gems to festival fresh independent releases, they showcase films from celebrated directors like PTA, but also lesser known auteurs, like the great Korean director Hong Sang-soo, who's the focus of a new devil feature. I always know all the films on their platform are gonna be worth my time because they are expertly curated. So head over to movie.com slash the discarded image for your 30 day extended free trial. I'm really glad to have gotten this video out of my system because I've been a big fan of PTA since I saw Magnolia in the cinema at just 16 years old. I can't believe it was that long ago, but it's great to see that he's still making films as strong as Phantom Fred, which I thought was one of his best. And I'm planning to do a live stream here on YouTube in a week's time where I discuss this video in a bit more detail, but also respond to any questions you might have. I'll leave info about that in the comments. And I still have a limited amount of VIP passes available from Mubi for new supporters on Patreon. I'm really trying to make this channel a more significant priority right now, so any support I can get is really going to help me do that. And finally, I have a new video out in about a fortnight, so make sure to turn on notifications if you haven't already. And as always, thanks for watching.